the, um, the actual approach that we're using uh, for this is um, we start with our calibration recording as before. We band pass filter it in a particular frequency band. And um, so we are using 0.5 to 15 hertz here to get rid of some low frequency things. And we think there isn't much higher frequency content than, say, 15 hertz, which is a good number. Uh, there's obviously trade-offs and so on. It isn't always true. But that's a good start. We go on and extract our epochs like we discussed before. Uh, it's multi-channel samples for, for real this time. Um, we label them with A for incorrect and B for correct. So we get 330 trials. And now let's plot these things. Um, so these are some ER, um, ERP uh, properties actually um, plotted for multiple trials uh, in some kind of a stochastic manner. Say all the green trials um, give you this green distribution, all the red trials give you this red distribution. In this particular case, it's actually a slightly different task. Um, that's why the time scales are a bit different. But what you already see is this. Red is sort of the class in which nothing happens, say. And it's sort of a flat line, almost. And green, uh, but it has rather high variance. And green in this particular example is the time because it actually ha has an ERP here. Um, and this is something that frequently occurs in signal detection things. Did he, s um, did he see it or did he not, and so on. Um, but uh, it can very well happen, again, in, in actual data that these are just, you know, for both conditions, you just have some uh, time cores and you're trying to find, um, uh, say, what features are and what parts of this are actually informative. If you look at this, you can already see, actually, that if you pick this sample here and looked at just the value at this sample, in you would um, and said if it's above a certain value, it's uh, you know class one. If it's below a certain value, it's class two. That already gets you pretty far. Um, so this is the most informative single sample. But you can do better if you are averaging multiple samples, kind of get rid of high frequency noise, and if you combine information across multiple areas, you know it's just then uh, fundamentally more informative. Uh, you use more of the data and so on. So we we'll switch to a cartoon here. Um, you have your response, and you have multiple trials. We we'll label, you know, we we'll draw some of them red and some of them in green. Actually, we have the mean and the standard deviation here. Uh, the mean is the thick trace, and the standard deviation is the dotted trace. So um, we continue to extract features, but but this time we are using features that are linear in the data. The features are just averages in certain time ranges. We say, this time range is interesting, um, informative. We will average data in here, integrate, basically, information. We will do this for this time range. And we think this time range here is also interesting. It's probably independent of the others. You know, um, there's stuff happening in between which we ignore. Uh, so we reduce dimensionality also quite aggressively here. We trim it down to three numbers per channel. This is one channel. We have multiple channels. Of course, we do basically the same for the other channels. Also, for three time windows in this particular case, average. So again, uh, if this was just one channel, we would have, again, a 3D feature space. We had a distribution, except that now it's actually higher dimensional. So now we have number of channels times, say, three or five. And so if for 100 channels, you might have 500 dimensions. And as we already said, LDA has trouble dealing with, say, 100 dimensions or 500 or so, because it needs to estimate that squared number of parameters for the covariance matrices and so on. And so uh, we might be stuck here. It, however, it turns out that there is a way to fix that problem. There's a way to fix LDA so that it is able to deal with um, basically degenerate covariance matrices. And that is called, um, this technique is called shrinkage. It's uh, a way to, um, let's say, it's a way to control um, the effective number of degrees of freedom, sort of, in the parameters that the classifier learns. It's a way to um, penalize overly complex and overly rich and expressive models and encourage simpler models, in a way models that are just simple enough that you manage to capture what you need to capture. 
And so that's an example of regularization. Uh, it's just a, this, is, this is just a traditional machine learning term for that procedure. You say, oh, well, um, there's multiple possible models that I could learn. These over here are way too complex. They have too many parameters. I'm learning a simpler one, and I'm trying to find one which is just simple enough that I managed to capture the relevant structure. What happens here is actually really simple. The idea is just, instead of learning the raw covariance matrix, which if you have fewer observations and you have channels, is, is degenerate, actually. It's not a full rank matrix. It's not invertible. So this inverse would give you NANs or something like that. Take this um, matrix and um, blend it linearly with an identity matrix that's sort of scaled to the right scale, uh, although that's actually not necessary. So we introduce a new parameter, lambda, here, which is our trade-off between a, a classifier that assumes that there is no covariance structure. It's just the identity matrix. It's just a spherical blob for the red distribution and for the green distribution. Uh, you retrade this very simplistic one versus the one that estimates a full covariance matrix. And we try to find the right position there. Um, so the lambda, we don't have an equation here to learn the lambda. By the way, all the rest is the same as we had from LDA. We don't have an equation for lambda, but we can use, uh, well, various techniques. We can use parameter search to tune the lambda, right? We can use the technique that we discussed at the previous lecture, where you say, I'm trying several values here. I'm trying 0.0. .0 open one, and so on and so on. I'm doing cross-validation for each one to see how well my classifier happens to work with that setting. And then we pick the one that gives us the best performance. So that's, uh, that's a very, very general approach that is um, permeating all of machine learning, uh, or much of machine learning, basically, where you say we introduce free parameters to trade off complexity, and we cross-validate to find the best setting. Although there's fundamentally other ways to, to do it, there's, um, that's an empirical way of doing it. You know, it's kind of statistical, bootstrapping, uh, and so on. There's also um, a sort of competing way of doing it using Bayesian inference, where you say um, we are sort of learning a, a model that, um, you know, is, is as well determined and as simple as we can afford to estimate it under, in a, under a unified probabilistic um, perspective. But this is a simpler kind of approach. Works probably about just as well. Uh, there's only one thing, and that is parameters which can be pretty slow. So obviously, if you're trying 10 values and you have a five-foot cross-validation, you basically calculate the same thing 50 times. And so that's 50 times as slow as what you would have done if you didn't have this parameter. Um, and if you then have an outer cross-validation to evaluate how well this procedure works, it's another five times. So um, in the special case of LDA, there is actually an equation to calculate this lambda. Um, it's pretty complicated. Um, it makes some assumptions. It's an uh, analytic solution that amounts to some kind of least squares uh, assumption, convex optimization, and so on. Um, you can find this on the internet uh, for, for shrinkage LDA or analytic shrinkage LDA. It's also implemented in BC IDAP. Um, but fundamentally, there's this way of cross-validating in many cases, and, uh, or in all cases, and in some cases, you are lucky enough to have an analytical expression for this parameter. So uh, that takes us um, to the end of this computation approach. So this is how we fix LDA um, to have it learn a spatial filter, and we'll see how that works um, in, the, in the next part.